Well, I'm surprised at how many folks are out here <laughs> this morning. I really didn't expect this large a crowd. Good job, Core Church. We love you guys. Uh, yeah, give yourselves a hand. Good job getting out here Sunday morning. You know, I wasn't sure about 9.30. I, uh, Brad knows I'm not an early riser. I, uh, you know, usually preach at about 11 at most churches, so we'll just pray that I'm awake. Alive. Uh, my wife is here, so she will make sure. Lori, stand up. Lori is the love of my life and uh, wouldn't be here without her. Oh, and my mom and dad are here. They are, uh, mom and dad uh, are 105. Uh, no, they're, they're, they're in the young 80s, the, the rocking 80s, and they're just doing great. And uh, they are just. Uh, we love them so much. We're just so glad to have them in our lives. And I know many of you uh, from uh, our time here at Core Church, we've been kind of uh, a part and in and out of this community because of our relationship with uh, Pastor Brad and Laura. And we have friends here and uh, people that we've got to know. So it's good to see all of you, though some of you, I'm not sure I recognize you with your mask. So it is great to be with you. And I want to... Uh, take a few moments this morning uh, to talk about something really, really close to my heart. I've uh, titled this talk, The Elusive Hunt for Happiness. And no, that is not a typo. That is how you spell happy, and that's how you spell ness, all right? So happiness is this interesting pursuit that we have in life. Uh, in fact, it's really a part of the American creed, right? We have this right, according to our, our country creed, to pursue uh, life and liberty and happiness. And so we do that. We, we live our life for happiness, so many of us. And 2020 has defied that pursuit. I mean, when we think about the loss on so many levels that we've encountered since the 1st of March in this nation, it is almost unfathomable. I mean, we've lost, lost loved ones. We've lost family members. We've lost friends. We've seen people struggle financially. We've lost jobs. We've lost businesses. We've lost the god of sports. Uh, I mean, think of how many gods have literally been crushed in America in 2020. And as we look around, I think it's given us an opportunity uh, to, to both lament and to, to grieve this loss, to come alongside those that have experienced pain and hurt and brokenness, but also to perhaps like reevaluate uh, what life is all about, like who we really are and what we're really living for. Uh, you know, when you talk about happy people, I, you know, I, I moved to America. I, I came from Canada uh, over 30 years ago and uh, love Canada. I'm still a, still a Canadian citizen. But I... I loved America when I got here. I fell in love with this country. I fell in love with the, the freedoms and, and uh, the people and uh, the, the breadth and length of this nation and the, the diversity of it. And I've traveled every state in this country except for Alaska, so by God's grace someday. But I, I grew up in Canada. I know what Alaska's like, right? So it's cold <laughs> and it's snowy and there's, there's polar bears. That's all, that's all you need to know. But I, I've... I, I've I have literally fallen in love with America, and I feel like I'm more American today than I am actually Canadian because I've lived longer in America than I ever did in Canada. And, and yet as I've lived here, uh, you, when you travel and you speak and you have a chance to interact with people and, and uh, you begin to discover there's a lot of people in this country that have kind of got disillusioned with their happiness. In fact, 
This country is the richest, wealthiest country in the world. I mean, you can travel, uh, as some of you have, nation after nation after nation, and you'll never find a country in this world that has more than we do, and yet, America is number 15 in terms of happiness in studies of countries. How is that even possible? I read the other day that less than 25% of Americans are happy, really happy with their jobs and with their marriage. So how is that possible? Why is it that we can have so much, enjoy so much, and yet somehow not feel this sense of really true happiness. Some of you know I've shared a little bit of my story, and if you're interested in the whole story, you can uh, pick up the book after. I'll be back at the, at the table. But it's called Death by a Thousand Lies. And uh, the subtitle is My Cover-Up, My Crash, and My Resurrection from Sexual Addiction. So I, about 10 years ago, I came out of this, this crisis or went through this crisis where I literally lost everything. Lost my marriage, lost uh, all of our, uh, uh, you know, ministry, church, finances, foreclosures on, on, on our home, uh, you know, just everything. It was just like a complete uh, train wreck crisis disaster. And I, for five years, went into a, an emotional tailspin that I could not get out of. And I've always grown up, maybe like some of you, optimistic, you know, glass is always not just half full, but it's brimming over, and just this sense of, you know, joy and taking on life. And, and, and yet, for, for five years after this crisis, I just began to spiral emotionally. I began to lose every bit of optimism, every bit of hope, every bit of joy in my life, and it was the craziest thing. It had nothing to do with circumstances. I mean, my circumstances were terrible, but they actually began to improve. And as my life slowly began to improve, I found my emotional well-being declining. So I'm going down and down and down into what I can only describe as like this deep hole, this well that was 100 foot deep of, of just darkness and despair. And I couldn't get out of it, no matter what I did. I mean, I went to doctors, I went to psychiatrists, I went to counselors, I had people cast demons out of me, I pr had people pray for me, I, you know, got healthy, I exercised, I did everything I was supposed to do, but just struggled so much with finding any kind of joy or hope in my life again. There was just this depressing despair, and I couldn't break through. And so, I just began to go on this quest because I was alive every day and I had to live and I literally, this is, this is how I would live every day. I'd get up in the morning and I would go to work and do my work and I worked out of my home at the time. I was a marketing director for a, for a company that uh, did assemblies and bully proofing in schools and so uh, I'd, I'd do my work from home but literally every 15 minutes I could, I could muster just time away from my work or, or 30 minutes, I would just like go to my bedroom and, and, and sleep. Because sleep was the only way to get out of my unhappy life without killing myself. And I didn't want to do that. So I'd just go to sleep. And then I'd wake up again and I'd have to start over. And I'd go maybe two, three, four more hours and have another. I just couldn't wait to sleep to get away from this, this gnawing despair. And so I finally began to just go on this, this search for happiness. Like, I began to research, I began to ask questions, I began to meet with doctors, I began to uh, research the internet, and uh, went into the scripture. And I remember one day I opened the Bible and I, I, I opened it up to Ecclesiastes. You ever read Ecclesiastes? No. It's not a book that we read a lot. It's not a book people talk about. It's not a book people quote from. It's a book that actually was almost left out of the canon. When the, when the rabbis who kind of figured out what the canon of the Old Testament was going to be, uh, 
when they, they were picking all the books and choosing all the books, there were three that they weren't really sure about. Esther was number one, because there was no mention of God in Esther. And then the second one was Song of Solomon, because they thought it was a little bit racy, you know, just a little bit PG-13. And then the third one was Ecclesiastes. They weren't sure about that because it was so dang depressing. It's basically a king who has everything lamenting his life. And so I somehow found my, myself reading this book, trying to overcome my unhappiness. And I read in Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, the first couple of verses, Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> God is good. Life sucks. <laughs> and I looked up the word meaningless, I thought maybe it means happiness. <laughs> and in the Hebrew it means vapor or breath. In other words, <laughs> that's life, enjoy it. Just just the vapor. And I thought, well, it's got to get better. So I kept on reading. I got to chapter 4, and now he's really gone over the edge. He says, and I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has never yet been, who has not seen the evil that was done under the sun. He said, it just would have been better if I was never born. This is in the Bible, people. This is in the scripture. No one's ever quoted that as their promise, you know, as their memory verse for the, you know, no one's ever given that verse in children's church. Take that home, put it on your fridge. So Solomon had just this struggle with happiness and with, with life and what counts and where's the meaning and why... Why do I have everything? I've got, you know, like, I've got, you know, wives and, and I've got, you know, uh, you know, huge, huge gardens and I've got servants and I'm rich and I've got palaces and yet I'm so, so unhappy. And on some level it was like, oh, where do I go from here? But on some level it was like, thank God, I'm not the only one. That there was actually someone in the Bible that is struggling with the same stuff I'm struggling with. Because that's what I was calling out, saying, meaningless. What is the meaning of this life? Do you know more people in America die from suicide than they do homicide? That there are more people killing themselves than killing each other in our country. What do we do? How do we speak to this as believers? How do we, how do we make a declaration of hope as, as a church in this meaningless, unhappy world that we seem to live in. Well, I would point you to the great prophet, the great man of God. Many of you know his name. My Canadian brother, Jim Carrey, who said, I hope everyone can get rich and famous and have everything they ever dreamed of so that they will know it's not the answer. Well, we all can't get rich and famous. So let's find out what the answer is. I have a son my oldest son, who's mid-30s now, he attempted suicide when he was in his early 20s. It was a shock. I, we had no idea. Just all of a sudden at midnight, we get a text, and he's in you know, some hospital in downtown Dallas, and he's taking 200 Advil and a bunch of alcohol, and he's like in a coma. And by God's grace, somehow he made it through. And not long after that, he's a video and film producer, he was asked to go to Africa and to uh, shoot some, some uh, documentary footage for, for an organization over there. And uh, he sent me a picture while he was there. And I, I brought that picture this morning. This is my son, Jeremy. He's the white one. <laughs> and these are his friends. And with that email and a conversation that followed after that, he began to talk to me. He said, Dad, this was the most life-altering trip I've ever taken because I got there, and I'm with these people. As you can see, 
that don't need a lot of clothes, that don't need a lot of stuff, they don't have, you know, smartphones or laptops and they don't have beautiful big homes and they don't have cars and they, they just kind of, you know, have very little in their life. But he said, I've never seen people so happy. These people are just happy and I'm mad at them. Like, how can you be happy? You don't have what I have. You don't live where I live. You don't have all the modern, beautiful things that, that I've got in Dallas, Texas. How can you be happy? And it just baffled him. And so he joined me, my son did, in this quest to how do we find happiness? And I finally came across something that changed my life. It wasn't even in the Bible, but it led me to scripture that I'd never uncovered before. So I'm reading along and I'm doing research and I find this study online. It was done by a guy named James Montier. Now, James Montier is a global equity strategist, one of the best at investing money. They call him the prophet in pinstripes. This guy knows exactly what to buy, exactly how to make billions. In fact, that's what he does. He makes billions of dollars for other billionaires, and he did it for like 10 or 15 years in a row, and finally he stopped. And he looked around and he said, you know what? All these billionaires are unhappy people. They are not enjoying their lives. They're, some of them have committed suicide. Uh, their families are breaking up. Their kids are going astray. They, they're drunks. They're alcoholics. They're messed up. They're addicts. He said, what is going on? I am making them tons of money, and none of this money is making them happy. And then he said, and I'm not happy. I'm not happy. So he took a million bucks, went to an Ivy League school, and said, I want you to do a study to universally across the world find out what are the keys to happiness in human beings. So they took this million dollars, they interviewed thousands and thousands of people from every country in the world, getting data, acquiring facts, put it all together, distilled it down, and they finally came up with the three containers for human happiness. And I'm reading this article, and I can't wait to find out what the three containers are. Three containers for a human to be happy. Container number one, genetics. Really? Yes. That 50% of our human happiness comes from a predisposed genetic thing within us. Like some people are optimistic and joyful and some people are a little bit down. Some people are Eeyore and some people are Tigger, right? <laughs> and we, we don't like the Tiggers because they're way too happy for no reason, just bouncing around all the time like, why? Why are you so happy? Settle down. Life isn't that good. So that's stuff we have no choice over, right? We don't get to we don't get to choose our genetics. We're born with kind of how we, how we are personality-wise. Well, the second, go to this one. The second cup, the mini cup, the small cup. It contains 10% of our human happiness. 10%. So this one doesn't do much, but it does a little. So the 10% cup is this cup that they call circumstances. The job you have, how much money you have in the bank, where you live, where you were born, what color your, your skin is, what kind of car you have, what kind of job you, you have. 10%. 10%. This is what we live for, isn't it? Our cars, our homes, our jobs, our bank accounts, our clothing, our stuff. Isn't this what America lives for? We are giving our lives away, investing everything we have 
for a 10% return of human happiness. Now, I'm okay with the 10%. I want all that I can get. I mean, I need that 10%, so I'm okay with stuff. I'm okay with a home and a car and clothing and all those things and having a bank account. I'm fine with all that. But I finally began to see that that is only going to account for 10% of any kind of joy or hope or happiness or optimism that I have in my life. And I found out that it came down to the third cup. That this in true reality was the only cup we had only control over. That circumstances, as we found out in 2020, can come and go. That we have no control over this pandemic. We have no control over what the government's doing. We have no control over how much money we actually have when stuff like this happens. But we have control over cup number three. And this is a 40% cup. And cup number three is what they called in this study intentional activity. Intentional activity. And they, and they narrowed it down to four things. Now, I want you to listen to these four things. These four things will change your life. Write them down. Make a mental note. Do whatever you have to do. But you have to know these four things. They said this intentional activity is intentionality in your faith, in your friendships, in your fun, and in your family. That if you are intentional with faith and friendships and family and fun, that you can add 40% of joy and happiness into your life. And not just any kind of faith, family, friendship, or fun, but what they call deep faith, where you go deep in your faith and deep in your friendships and deep with family and deep in enjoying the life that we have, that you get intentional about those things. And notice that none of those things have anything to do with money or fame or stuff or what we drive, but that's where we find happiness. So think about this. Let's say genetically you've got 40% on the meter instead of 50 Let's say you've got 5% of your circumstances working out. You're up to 45%. Let's say you get intentional in all those areas. You add another 40%. You're up to 85% happy. I can live with that. I'll sleep the 15% away. So I'm reading that, and I'm thinking, okay, that's all good, but, you know, I don't really live by philosophies. I live following Jesus. Philosophy is fine to know and statistics are great, but in the end, I'd like to know what does Jesus say about happiness? So I'll close with this. I start opening the New Testament. I go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus doesn't say one word about being happy. Not one word. Doesn't, doesn't talk about happy. And I keep reading and I keep reading. And finally, the Lord leads me to the Sermon on the Mount. And I go to the Sermon on the Mount and I feel this unction like I've got to really study through this sermon. Because of this, this was the first time God had ever spoken since the garden to humankind face to face. We all know that Jesus, according to Hebrews, was the express image of God, his exact representation, that he was God in the flesh. And so think about that, folks. God is speaking to humankind for the very first time in thousands of years on that Sermon on the Mount. It's his first message to us. Now, he had spoken through prophets and burning bushes and fires and all kinds of stuff, but now he is speaking face to face, and Jesus gets this crowd on this mountain, and the first thing he does, the very first words out of his mouth, he says, blessed are what? The poor. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for right or righteousness. He begins to go through these, what we call these nine blesseds or beatitudes. 
And so we're reading through these, and it's the first nine things he says, and he keeps repeating the word blessed, blessed, blessed. And he's inviting us into this life of giving our life away, showing mercy to those that maybe deserve justice, uh, living this, this sacrificial poor life, which doesn't have anything to do with money, but, but living in humility and, and, and living in, in this graciousness of giving our life away. He invites us into peacemaking, pulling people who are at odds uh, against each other back together. All of this self-giving, this life-giving way of life that Jesus asks us to encounter and enter into. But I keep coming back to that word blessed. 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 He uses it nine times in a row. Do you think he's trying to tell us something? Nine times in a row. First message ever in thousands of years. Blessed, 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 blessed. And I finally wake up and I finally get my thoughts together. I think, well, I wonder what that means. You know, because I, I really didn't have a clue what blessed meant. I mean, I got saved when I was 16. I was a heathen. Started going to this church. Everyone in the church is using the word blessed. Blessed. Come up to me. Oh, Brother Blaine, you're so blessed. You're a blessed young man. Oh, I'm just blessed to see you. You're blessed coming in. You're blessed going out. There's just blessing everywhere on you. And I, that was a Christian word, right? No one in my school used it. You know, my drug buddies didn't use it. Party buddies didn't use it. Like, what is this word blessed? I kind of thought, well, this means like God's favor, God's, you know, goodness, or whatever. I just didn't really know what it meant. And then I looked it up. And the Greek word for blessed is makarios. Makarios. And you know what it means? It was not a religious word. It was not a word that the Jews used. It was not a word of the synagogue. It was a word that the Romans and the Greeks used to describe their gods. They had thousands and thousands of God, this God and that God and sun God and, you know, the, the pleasure God, and they had all these gods. And they used the word makarios to describe their gods, and what they believed was that the gods had this makarios or this ecstasy that was unattainable in human life. That the gods had this divine ecstasy and meaning and, 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 and sense of, 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 of joy that humans couldn't have. And Jesus comes along and he grabs that word blessed and he takes it from them. And he says, I want to tell you that you can have the blessed life. Blessed is the man who is poor in spirit. Blessed is the woman that shows mercy. Blessed is the peacemaker. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst, not for the things of this world, but for righteousness. Blessed are you when you endure persecution and tribulation. He begins to invite us into the blessed life by what? Giving our lives away. By saying, if you will just give your life away to others, if you will just take your life and sacrificially lay it down for your neighbor, for your brother, for your sister, for your family, for your children, for your wife, for your friends, for your enemies, he said, you will encounter this life of divine joy, divine sense of, of God is with us. And I'll tell you this. When I finally saw that, I just said, God, you've got to help me do that. Teach me what it means to give my life away. Teach me what it means to live a life that is more about others than it is about myself. Because somehow I believe maybe I will find the joy and the happiness that I've been searching for. And my wife is a uh, witness to this, but in the last four years, five years, God has absolutely 
delivered me from despair and delivered me from depression and delivered me from a darkness of the soul. Because I discovered what the lamenter and Ecclesiastes discovered in chapter 12. After 12 entire chapters of saying life sucks, it is meaningless. He said, I finally come to this. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. That when we re-engage with God and allow God to re-engage with others, that everything changes for us. That all of a sudden, this ecstasy and joy of God that has nothing to do with stuff begins to take over our soul. I want to pray for you in this way as we close this morning. There are folks right now in this place, in this moment, that need to experience God's presence and God's joy. You have found yourself so far from that, from his joy, from his peace, from his comfort. And God wants to visit you with that, not in a feeling, but in a presence and in an understanding that he has never left you, he'll never forsake you. And that if you will respond by calling into the depth of life-giving love to others, Watch what he's going to do in your life. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes just for a moment. And I'm I'm going to do something. We're about to receive the Lord's table together as we close and receive his broken body, receive his shed blood, acknowledge our desperate need of him, Acknowledge that our our forgiveness and our joy is only found in Him. But if you're here right now and you say, man, Blaine, this this has really spoken to me on so many levels. And I want this. I want to encounter not a happiness that the world tries to grab, but I want to encounter this joy, this ecstasy of God in my life. I want to know what it means to begin to give my life away and to encounter God's presence in such a meaningful way. Would you just, wherever you are, you've been struggling. It's been, you know, maybe a depression or maybe just a despair or maybe just a listlessness or maybe just a very, very, very difficult time of just getting up every day and living. Maybe you're where I was where you just couldn't hardly find a reason to get up in the morning. But if that's you on any level, would you just slip your hand up right now and put it up, put it down? I want to pray for you. I want to just pray for you. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Yes. A couple ladies there. Who else? Anyone else? Way at the back. God bless you. Over here, over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just tell all of you that have raised your hands, first of all, Jesus is madly in love with you. God the Father just takes delight in you. He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. He just can't wait to engage you, to support you, to strengthen you, to allow his spirit to comfort you. And right now, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we pronounce and speak the makarios of God, the blessing of Jesus into each of these lives. Lord, visit them with your spirit. Give them strength. Give them hope. Give them eyes that see beyond the circumstances of this world into a better world, the kingdom of God. This kingdom where Jesus is Lord and the lives of others matter as much as our own life. In fact, that we actually find our life when we give it away. So, Lord, strengthen them. Protect each one that has lifted their hand. Give them grace this morning. Deliver them from hopelessness and despair. Send people into their life that will wrap their arms around them, love them, care for them as they care for others. Thank you, Lord, for doing such a deep work 
in their soul. And I pray, God, for all of us this morning that as we come up to encounter the Lord at these, these tables, that we'd be reminded that He ultimately gave His life away for us. That it's in this table, it's in this blood, it's in this bread that we find life, that we find joy, that we find hope. And Lord, even as Jesus gave his life away, we recognize today that he's been exalted above every other name. That he's seated at the right hand of God over all principality, power, might, and dominion. That in the giving of his life, Lord, everything was given to him. And so as we come to honor, to participate in that sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins, for the healing of our souls, we also, as we drink and as we, as we break bread in our mouth, we, we actually are committing to be like Jesus, to be willing to lay down our lives in this world. Bless your people. Give them grace. Bless Core Church. Bless Brad and Laura and the beautiful team that worked so hard, God, to bring the gospel into this community and around the world. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.